Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. So let's look at the concepts, right? And one of the things is mostly the open API specifications. So you write a specification file, okay? When you are creating a new API, you need to write the specification file for that, okay? And this is mostly done in YAML, right? Yet another markup language. It could potentially be done in JSON also. The important thing is it contains structure, which means that it can be sort of read by a machine without any ambiguity. So the machine will be able to get a clear picture of what you are trying to convey, okay? The most sort of trivial example is something like this, right? So this, what I have over here is an example of a YAML file. Exact details of how YAML is implemented, how it is meant to be passed and so on, I am not going to get into over here. That's a little bit beyond the scope of what we can do now. Broadly speaking, what YAML is doing is it's similar to the notion of, you know, the keys and values that were there in JSON or in, in general in a dictionary, right? So what it has is it has a key which says open API, which has this value 3.1.0, which is basically treated as a string, but which gives the version number, right? Because it's got like two points over here, it can't be a number, but so it's just stored as a string essentially. What does it contain? It contains info, which in turn contains two sub pieces of information. One of them is title and one is version. So the title basically says that, you know, it's a minimal open API document. The version says 0 0.001. And then it has one thing saying paths, which in this case has just been defined as a null array or a null object. Okay, it doesn't contain any entries. No endpoints have been defined. This by itself is a valid open API document, okay? What would happen if you read through something like this? You only get the information that it's a minimal open API document with this version number using this version of open API, which does not have any endpoints, okay? So it's not a particularly useful document, but just serves to show that this is the minimal structure that you can expect to see. So, you know, most of what I'm going to show over here are examples from the OAI, uh, the Open API um, documentation, right? Which is available at oai.github.io. And, you know, uh, these pictures as well as some of the succeeding things are all from there, right? So what does the Open API by itself contain? You can see that, you know, we already had this Open API, the info and the paths, right? These are sort of the three main requirements of an Open API object. Now, in turn, paths would contain paths object, which would have multiple endpoints. So it would have endpoint 1, endpoint 2, endpoint 3. An endpoint would have a path item object. Okay, so what is an endpoint, right? In any API, what we refer to as the endpoint is that URL that you are going to access and the type of request that you need to send to that URL. Okay, when you combine those two together, it's called an endpoint. So a get request to wikipedia.org slash rest.php slash something something is one particular endpoint on the Wikipedia API, okay? So each of these endpoints has a corresponding path item object, which basically tells the type of request, the operation, you know, each of these has an operation object or rather the path item object has a list of operations. Each of these is an operation object, which has a summary, a description, request body, responses, etc. So in other words, what it's saying is, uh, corresponding to the get, I will have one full operation object. That operation object, I would have, you know, a brief summary saying what it's supposed to do, a description that gives a little bit more detail on what I should, how I should use that get request to this particular endpoint. And, uh, Sorry, let me just correct that. An endpoint is basically just a URL by itself and the operation to be performed on that URL when combined with the endpoint will give you specific behaviors. So in this case, the operation could be something like get. It will be summarized and described. It can say whether or not it has a request body. Request body usually refers more to the post, response, uh, post kind of operations, right? Where they actually have text in the body that needs to be sent across. It describes what kind of responses you can expect for this operation, some more information, etc. Now, these responses in turn could be different HTTP codes, 
200, 404, 400, something of that sort. For each of those response uh, codes, it has more information, which could basically say, this is the description, status okay, right? Okay, everything is fine. I created a new shopping cart for you, right? And the content, which basically says, okay, this is what was finally created, something like that. So this is sort of the overall structure that you can expect to see inside an open API specification document. Okay. What does it look like in YAML format? We'll look at a couple of examples, right? So like I said, this is the same thing. Some of these examples are from the running example, which they have on the open API web page, which is for, you know, a web app, which plays the game tic-tac-toe, right? Knots and crosses. So you would be familiar with that, right? I mean, you basically have like a grid out here. And you have to put X's and O's such that you get three X's in a line or three O's in a line and whoever gets it right first will win. So they are sort of trying to say, <clears throat> how do we create an API that will allow playing such a game? Okay. Now that's interesting because if you think about it, what is it doing? This API is only encoding the functionality of the game. It's telling you that, for example, you can create a new game. You can put an X or an O in a specific location. And finally, you can retrieve the state of the board and you can also, you know, find out who won, right? It doesn't tell you anything about how to display the board, how to make an X or an O in a specific location, how to decide whose turn it is. None of that information is being specified as part of the API, okay? So that separation is very much there. And what we are trying to do, as we will see, is it basically tells you information about the functionality. This part, the open API and the info is something that you already saw, right? So we had a title and version earlier. Now it also has a description. And as you can see, this is all part of YAML, right? It just basically allows you to have a multi-line description. So all of this is sort of the header part. Then come the paths. Previously, in the you know trivial example that we saw, it was just a null, right? Basically saying there are no paths over there. Here, for example, we would have paths. So there might be a path which says slash board that can be used, for example, to get the present state of the board. Okay. What are the kinds of things that we could have under board? I might have something to get, which will basically allow me to retrieve the present state of the board. I might have something called put, which allows me to create a new game, right? Or I could potentially even have put that allows me to create a partially filled game, right? It create the sort of nine square grid, but also pre-populate it with some values of X's and O's, okay? That I don't know, it all depends on what you are trying to do. But the point is it is specifying what kind of functionality can be done. Let's get a little bit more detail on the get itself. Under slash board, we have get. For get, we basically get the summary. This is the whole board. Description could be longer. It could be multiple lines. In this case, this is also just one line parameters and responses, okay? Are there any parameters that I need to provide to the board in order to get its current state? And what kind of response can I expect to see from the board, okay? What are the possible responses? One of them is 200, which basically says, yeah, you know, successful request. This is the state of the board. Or it could be a 404. 404 is typically a not found error. Right, which basically says, okay, there's no board. What are you asking me for? Okay. Inside the responses, I could go further and say, okay, for 200, the description is, yeah, everything went fine and content could be, you know, some more information, which is most likely the actual state of the board. This is not text. The content is most likely going to be something which has some other format, like, you know, it could be a JSON description of the board or something like that. So content could also be of multiple types. You could basically say if the person had requested saying they can accept application slash JSON, return a JSON representation of the board. If they have requested text slash HTML, you have to return it as some HTML format. Okay. So this is interesting. What it's telling you is that, you know, as part of the API, I could also request different formats of data, right? What ultimately happens over there is the controller will get this information from the server side it's just going to get back data in some standardized format 
the controller can then choose which view to return to you depending on what type of content you are willing to accept. Okay, so the server still does not have to know the server, the model, underlying model still does not need to know whether you are looking at HTML or JSON. It just returns data to the controller and the controller's job is to pick the appropriate view and send it back. And you know, inside this thing, inside the content application JSON, you could actually have a schema which sort of gives information about what kind of information is going to be retrieved when you try to get the board. In this case, this is just an example, right? It says type integer minimum 1, maximum 100. That This is probably not relevant for the tic-tac-toe board game, right? But in general, it would be something which says some information about what kind of content you can expect to get back when you do a get request on the board, okay? So you can sort of see the flow over here, right? We started all the way back from here, right? A minimal document. We start off with this and we basically say these are the paths. Inside a path, you could have multiple different types of request. Inside a request, you have different you know, parts that uh, describe it in more detail. For the responses, these are the different codes that you could have. For a given code, you could have more information including what type of content it takes. For the content, you could have different types of application formats or content formats that it will accept. And inside one of those, you might actually give a specification with a schema saying how the data is actually being represented. Okay. So, you know, you could in fact go a bit further than that. With this schema, you could also have something which says this is actually a complex data type, right, which actually has, it is a type object with the following properties. It has a product name, which is of type string, a product price, which is of type number and so on. In other words, the JSON object that you get back would be some kind of a complicated object, which will follow this schema, okay? Along with all of this, these were the responses that I was talking about. You might also have things which in the path can specify parameters. So slash users slash ID now says, ID is a parameter which is present in the path and is required. If you do not have it, if you just give slash users without a slash ID, then there should be some error in the API or at least you should, the response should be that, you know, I did not get the ID. This was required. Okay. Similarly, you could also have something which says that the request body could have a certain kind of structure. It might itself be, a, it is expected to be a JSON blob of text which has some kind of a structure, which basically in this case is an integer, right? So with all of this, let's sort of try and summarize where we are, right? What would be the main purpose of having a document like this, right? Let's say that I have got to this point where I have all of this schema and everything else in place. As you can see, I could probably write a script which will take in this YAML file and pretty much generate a lot of Python code for me, which implements almost all of these functions except for the exact details of how to implement certain things, right? So for example, you know, how to create a board, how to display it, the final view, those kind of things are still open. But the fact that the board needs to be created, that a function is needed for that, the API call is required over there, all of that information is already taken care of in this YAML specification. Not just that, a lot of documentation is also present here because the descriptions are present, right? And from the descriptions, you can just basically extract out and create a, you know, the kind of documentation pages that we saw for the Covin and Wikipedia APIs, okay? So that essentially is the problem that Swagger is trying to solve. It has combined that documentation as well as the code generation into a single file, right? What's the catch? Once you try doing all of that, YAML itself is complicated to write, right? It's not as bad as, for example, writing XML, but on the other hand, it's not easy to get it right without any errors on its own, okay? So, which brings us finally to what are known as best practices, okay? And over here, finally, what, you know, this is sort of to summarize everything that we have about OpenAPI. The sort of core idea of something like an OpenAPI specification is to say, Try and do design first rather than writing code first, okay? Design your system to have the right kind of APIs, right kind of interfaces so that somebody else can use it. 
before you start writing any code. Okay, that's always important, right? The in in general, the thing is, you know, you spend twenty minutes or twenty days or twenty months, whatever, on design versus one day on coding. It's much better than trying to write, you know, five days of coding without having thought about it, because you will then spend the next month or two trying to debug your code and fix problems with it. The more time that you spend in the design and trying to get that part clean, the better will be your ability to debug it and to get it right the first time around. Now, something like an open API specification, which can be read by humans as well as by machines in order to generate code if necessary, is what is called a single source of truth. Okay, So, the idea of behind a single source of truth is that if I just have one document over there, I can actually derive most of the structure of the code from that document using some kind of a script if necessary, right? Or the documentation itself can be obtained from that document, right? The other possibility is that I say my code is primary, right? The code is the most important thing. I already started writing the code. This is great, you know, and I know that I've done everything correctly. Therefore, that is the single source of truth and all your documentation has to then come from that. Okay. Either way, avoid a possibility where you are writing code in a certain way, documentation in a different way, and they are diverging from each other. Okay. Things like specification documents are ideally suited for version control. Right. So things like Git should be used in order to manage specification documents because they are things that can change with time. And you do want to know how they evolve with time, what feature was added when, by whom, and hopefully if there is a suitable comment, for what reason. Okay. And one other important thing about things like open API, remember that it's open and it's meant to sort of be public. Right. Now, why is that important? Because you might be designing an, an app which only you intend to use, in which case, of course, you can't really be expected to make your APIs public. But just like Wikipedia, Coven, GitHub, Google Cloud, all of those are showing, by making your APIs public, it allows not just public documentation and people to understand easily what is happening, but it allows things to grow in a much more organic fashion. Other people start to use your APIs in ways that you could not have you know, come up with or you maybe don't have the time to support. Okay. And finally, coming back to the important problem what I just mentioned, which is that YAML itself is difficult to write. Don't try to write all of it, right? There are automated tools, there are editors. I am not sort of, you know, going to be discussing any of them specifically as part of these lectures, but using such editors and tools is an important part of making sure that you are able to get such, uh, you know, the API standards done correctly, right? In a way that makes it easy for somebody else to use. Okay. So, using such tools and sort of constructing code from it, constructing documentation from it, making sure all of them are in sync is a very important part of how you can design a scalable and an easy to maintain web application.